Hello students, um, I'm Professor Hammond and today we will be talking about infrared spectroscopy and NMR spectroscopy. Infrared and NMR spectroscopy um, and are part of nearly every chapter set of problems uh, for the entire semester of 242 and it's useful if you know how to use and do your NMR and IR nearly instantaneously. Um, so we're going to start with infrared or IR for short spectroscopy. Um, you should know we'll just call it infrared IR spectra. You should know that infrared by itself rarely gives you an exact structure. You must have additional information, but the infrared spectra is used primarily to identify functional groups. And the importance of functional groups in the infrared is um, what is not there is probably just as important as what you do see in the spectrum. And so we'll talk and we'll do some examples from the book about what's there, what's not there um, when you do that when we get to the, the, the examples. Now, what I want to do is start with the basic spectrum. Um, and we're going to divide it up into regions. So, the first region is going to start at around 3,000 to 4,000. And then we'll drop down to about 2,000. 1700 will be an important section. 1400. Um, we'll go all the way down to 900. And then we'll end up 9, 8, 7, 6. We'll end up about 600. Okay. Now, the reason I kind of put these numbers up here is you will see the spectrum. Let, uh, frequencies for different absorptions and what happens in an IR if, if a functional group matches a wavelength the peak goes down we call it it has a huge absorption so the peaks always refer to the bottom of the graph not the top of the graph it's kind of upside down because the higher the absorption we say the bigger is or stronger is that peak uh, it's really a valley but it we call them peaks Okay, so the first zone that you need to be aware of is the hydrogen zones. I'm going to put a 2500 right in the middle. All of the hydrogen absorptions for all type of functional groups um, always shows up somewhere between 2500 and 4000. And since hydrogens are a fundamental part of organic chemistry, we should be able to quickly identify different types of hydrogen just by glancing at the graph. So the first types are the most common, which is the carbon hydrogens. I'm drawing a dotted line straight down from 3000. The 3000 line is a very important dividing line for the carbon hydrogen peaks. The being is, is that the most common peaks you see for carbon hydrogens are either on the 2900 side, so this is approximately the 2900s, or they're on the 3000 to 3100 side. Okay, and they can be the same height, they're usually spiky, and they're usually really close to this 3000 line. Now, the cool part is, is that if they're on the 2900, that's the carbon hydrogen where the carbon is sp3 hybridized. Conversely, if it's on the 3000 side, that's the carbon hydrogen peak where the carbon is sp2 hybridized. Now, some organic chemists like to distinguish between the different sp2 carbons. For example, aromatic carbons um, tend to be a little bit more below um, are a little closer to 3100 whereas pure hydrogens are around 3000. I don't like to distinguish between them because sp2 uh, carbon hydrogen bonds tend to always show up right around the 3000 to 3100 uh, range. 
Now, if you're asking yourself, okay, all carbons are usually either sp3 or sp2, and if I ask you what's the other type of hybridization for carbon in the organic world, you better say sp1. The catch is to have an sp1 carbon, that requires the carbon to have a triple bond. Most carbon-carbon triple bonds are in the middle of a chain, and they have zero hydrogens. That being said, if you actually have a triple bond at the very end of the chain, then you have the opportunity for a carbon-hydrogen bond that comes in at about 3,300. It's a really rare one. It's so rare that oftentimes the peaks are very small, but that will happen as a carbon-hydrogen is sp1 carbon. So again, typically only happens if the triple bond is at the very end of the chain, which could be useful if you're trying to determine the structure. Uh, most of the times, though, the triple bonds don't end up in the middle of the chain or somewhere else. Okay, so those are your basic uh, hydrogens on carbon. There's one more special one we will come to a little bit later, but we want to talk about the other types of hydrogens. So what are the other types of hydrogens that you run into? Well, that is primarily OHs and NHs. The OHs and the NHs both absorb around 3,300, but they tend to be much larger than a simple CH. Um, and depending on how much hydrogen bonding is occurring, whether it's a solid crystal and there's almost no hydrogen bonding, it'll be a peak, a pointy peak, where if it's in a liquid and there's extensive hydrogen bonding, these usually look like broad humps. So most people like to distinguish o the OH bond or the NH bond as at 3300 again, but it's usually a broad hump. Uh, one of the cool things about nitrogen is nitrogen does have the capability of having two hydrogens. And if that we have a compound that has two hydrogens, this would be a, called a primary amine. This would, in the 3300, be a double humped peak. Um, very classic of a two, of an NH2 is having two humps and the 3300 are two absorptions. Uh, again, they will narrow down if there's less um, hydrogen bonding, but if there's a lot of hydrogen bonding, then um, we get the NH bonds. Okay, so those are your very common, your alcohols give you the OH, the amines give you the NH. So this was a primary amine. I want to talk about that. That'll become important when we come to the amine chapter. The ones with single hy hydrogens, those are secondary amines. Um, there is such things as tertiary amines, but a tertiary amine is an amine with zero hydrogens. So if you're doing amines and they say there's no absorption in the 3300s, or in other words, it's flat here, that means that amine is tertiary because it does not have any hydrogens attached to it. Okay, so we covered most of the hydrogen. There's one more I want to talk about, and that's the water and the acids. Water and acids have internal hydrogen bonding and they do an extreme wipeout of the hydrogen zone. So I forgot to say this, the hydrogen absorption range is usually between 2,500 to 4,000. Okay, if you have a carboxylic acid or if you made a mistake in lab and we were running your IR and you had water um, what happens in both of these cases, let's move this up, so, sorry, I went right off the graph here. Um, and I'm going to leave these as comparison. The extreme hydrogen bonding of a carboxylic acid is such that it tends to what we call wipe out the hydrogen zone. The hydrogen bonding will start over here and it will go right through the CHs and tail over towards the 200. Whenever I saw this on students' um, um, products, I knew they had water stuck in their products when we ran the IR or their samples, unless we were trying to make a carboxylic acid. So the absorption of water and carboxylic acids is huge and broad. Okay, 
So I want to leave the hydrogen zone for a second and we'll go to the next zone over. We'll come back to it. As I said, there's one special hydrogen I want to talk about that occurs later. So let's pull this back down. We don't want to have water. The next zone over is the triple bonds. Uh, there's only two types of triple bonds, and that's either the carbon-carbon triple bond or the carbon-nitrogen triple bond. Almost invariably, they always show up at 2250. And they show up in such a way, I'm going to write 2250 down here, that this part of a normal infrared spectrum is usually flat. And you'll see spectrum after spectrum, flat, flat, flat. There's nothing in the triple bonds. And all of a sudden, when you see a, a peak around 2250, you know you have a triple bond. Um, again, going back to the issue we had here, you can have a triple bond, either one of these, without having this hydrogen. Because this hydrogen only occurs if it, the triple bond's at the end of the chain. Okay, so the triple bond zone, almost always right around 2250. I was going to show you some spectrums really fast. And here's a simple hydrocarbon. You notice 2250 flat. You go to another spectrum, 2250 flat. You go to another spectrum, <gasps> there's a spike at 2250. That's always evidence of a triple bond. Um, and so, uh, triple bonds stand out, as we like to say, almost like a sore thumb. They're very rare, but they're in the f area that's normally flat. Okay, so carbon-carbon triple bonds, carbon-carbon-nitrogen triple bonds, the carbon-nitrogen triple bonds, always at approximately the same place. Okay, the next region basically goes from 1,400 to 2,000. Um, this region is known as the double bond region. So all of your double bonds uh, show up between 1400 usually to 2000. Okay. Double bonds are very common in organic chemistry and probably the most significant one are the carbon oxygen double bonds. Uh, we actually will spend one whole chapter on special carbon oxygen double bonds that's in the carboxylic acid chapter uh, and then we also spend chapters on the normal carbon oxygen double bonds so let's talk about the normal carbonyls the carbonyls normally show up right around 1700 um, and the normal carbonyls i'm going to write these really small uh, is the aldehyde carbonyl, the ketone carbonyl, um, the ester carbonyl, and the carboxylic carbonyl. Okay, so I'm going to talk about these four carbonyls. Generally speaking, they look nearly identical on the infrared. Some people will argue that the ester and the acid carbonyls tend to be slightly higher than the aldehyde and ketone. But when I say slightly higher, they usually come in around 1720. Oh, one of the things about carbonyls, they tend to always be the most absorption, highest absorbing func peaks. And they usually show up around 1720, give or take 20. Now, what's really cool about carbonyls is if any one of these four carbonyls is actually attached to a benzene ring. So, in the case of the aldehyde, there'd be a, a benzene ring here. In the case of a ketone, one side or the other is a benzene. Uh, same is true with the ester or the carboxylic acid. Whoops, that doesn't look like an acid. Let's change that to an acid. Okay, if there's a benzene right next to it, right next to the carbonyl, every one of these four functional groups immediately shifts to the 1690s. So I always like to put 
a hump on this side. This is the 1690s. So again, either side of the 1700, really close to 1700, very strong absorptions. This side is a carbonyl touching a benzene ring. This side is not. Um, and that could be a clue also. Is if you know it's on this side, then you know the benzene ring is not touching the carbonyl. Conversely, if the carbonyl is on this side, the benzene is right next to the carbonyl. Okay, sadly, um, your textbook talks about carbonyl shifting beyond this narrow range. So this range, the 1690s to, to about 1740, I'm going to put up to 1740. That's usually the range for normal carbonyls. If you find a carbonyl peak that's outside like up in the 1800s or 1900s or down below close to 1600 in the 1500s, then that carbonyl is not one of these four. Um, those carbonyls, and just to give you an example, um, if you go up to the 1800s, so I'm going to draw a line here. Let's, really, let's do red this time. So if we go around 1800, okay, and you have a carbonyl stretch either close to 1800 or above 1800, that tends to be the carbos, um, the acid halides. I'm just going to write acid halides on this side. They're always above 1800. And the anhydrides. Okay. And we will we'll learn more about these specifically when we cover the acid chapter and the acid derivatives. So these two are considered special acid derivatives. So really high absorption, usually acid halides or acid anhydrides. They're not the normal four. Conversely, we'll go the other way. When it goes down close to the 1500s, so let's put 1500s now. If it's on this side of the 1500s, the carbonyls are usually amides. Uh, amides are characteristics because that's also called the peptide bond and, and protein. And if they go below, f um, oh, sorry, I wanted to put 1600. Let's rephrase what I just said. Okay, amides tend to be in the low 1600s, like 1625, 1630, sometimes 1650, but definitely below 1690. If they go below 1600 and then the 1500 side, that tends to be the salts. We sometimes call that the cation effect, but an acid salt, and again, these are acid derivatives, is when you have a metal with a positive charge. That takes this absorption and moves it below um, 1600 and puts it into the 1500 range. Okay, so that will take care of almost every carbonyl that you will see this semester and as i said during 242 we're going to focus on aldehydes and ketones for two chapters acids and acid derivatives for at least one maybe two chapters and so the carbonyl functional groups are very important now one of the trick questions is how do you distinguish the four basic um, carbonyl functional groups from the IR absorption, and the answer is you cannot. It's a trick question. Aldehydes, ketones, esters, and acids, <clears throat> especially if they're against uh, next to a benzene ring, they look all look identical in the carbonyl zone. So to identify which one of these four, you have to look elsewhere. Of the four, probably the one that's automatic is the carboxylic acids. Whenever you have a carboxylic acid, you're going to have a strong carbonyl peak and you're going to have the hydrogen zone wiped out. So, I have an example. I'm going to show you right from the textbook. I'm going to put this up. This is obviously a carboxylic acid because the OH stretch has wiped it all out. And this is actually the picture. This is propanoic acid. But it had a strong carbonyl right about 1700, right where it's supposed to. Um, and then it had the OH wipeout. So acids must have both to be a carboxylic acid. The carbonyl stretch plus the OH stretch. Now, 
if it doesn't have the broad OH, then you say it's not an acid. You ruled it out. So could it be an aldehyde or a ketone or an ester? It could. And there's one special hydrogen that we want to talk about now. It's the hydrogen of the aldehyde. The hydrogen of the aldehyde um, absorbs very differently than um, normal hydrogen. Partly because it's on an sp2 carbon, that's an sp2 carbon, but also because of the electronegativity of the oxygen. So this hydrogen, we're going to call it the aldehyde hydrogen, we're going to go back to the hydrogen zone. I'm going to draw what it looks like. So usually that's 2750, 28. Usually an aldehyde hydrogen has a peak around 2750 and around 2850. We're just going to put that. Now, I should warn you that the numbers are not absolute. These are approximate. And if you see these before they go into the hydrogens of the rest of the carbon, and sometimes they get tilted because they start to merge together. There's an overlap of signals. But there's definitely two peaks down here. Below the 2900s, down in the 28, 27, you can bet most likely that's the hydrogen stretching that's coming off of an aldehyde. So that's a very unique peak. And it's one of the identifiers. This creates these two. One of the identifiers for an aldehyde is to look for that special hydrogen. Uh, when we go to proton NMR, we're going to discover that hydrogen is unique in a lot of ways. Um, uh, it has a lot of interesting properties. One of it is it's highly basic and not acidic. Um, so the, this hydrogen, unique stretch, plus an absorption. If you have both of those, you can bet you have an aldehyde. If you have a ketone, Ketones are really hard to tell. Basically, you guess you have a t ketone when you rule everybody else out. So you say, okay, no acid, check. No aldehyde, check. Ooh, what about the ester? Well, we haven't come to a way to identify esters yet, but we're going to arrive there shortly. Okay, so before I finish the double bond zone, I want to go talk about the other double bonds you see quite often. Okay, they're not as strong as the carbonyl double bond. They tend to be shorter in stature or their absorption is less and that's the carbon hydrogen or carbon carbon double bond. Okay, so what color can I insert in there? We're going to put in some blue. Okay. So I should make a 1600 line and a 1500 line. Carbon-carbon double bonds almost always show up between 14 and 1600. Uh, they're always spiky. They're not as broad. Uh, and I'm going to bring the 1600 line down. So pretend this is the extenuation of the 1600 line. Normally, a carbon-carbon double bond will be a spike on this side if it's conjugated in any way like inside of an aromatic ring. When you do aromatics, you usually get, uh, usually will have between two to four absorptions in this region. Uh, we're not going to go over the differences, but if you ever have a carbon-carbon double bond that's just barely above 1600 and you have this nice sharp peak, that tends to be a carbon-carbon double bond that's not conjugated. We call those isolated. So, and we'll have a whole chapter where we distinguish between isolated pi systems versus conjugated pi systems. But isolated carbon-carbon double bonds tend to be just over 1600. The aromatics and the conjugated ones tend to be between 1400 and 1600. Okay, so that will cover most of the double bonds. And again, the double bond zone basically ranges here most important one we always check for first is carbonyls because it will either have it or it won't. The carbon-carbon double bonds we'll come back to later. And I'll show you some examples once we finish the rest of the chart. Okay, the next region on this chart is basically between 1400 and 900. It's called the fingerprint region. 
every compound supposedly has a unique set of absorptions called their fingerprint. The fingerprint is where you obtain all the single bonds. And there's a myriad of different ones you can look for. For example, at 1430 is supposed to be the methyl one. It sometimes shows up quite often on alkanes. Uh, there's an isopropyl one at 1380. Uh, I usually don't, we usually don't even bother looking at the fingerprint region unless we're desperate. But there is one significant region in the fingerprint region, and that's between 1000 and 1200. And that's the oxygens. So between 1200 and 1000 are your carbon oxygen single bonds. They range between them, and there's a general way of distinguishing them. It's not perfect. I can't say it works 100%, but we're going to put it in the 90% category. The carbon oxygen absorptions are about the same strength as a carbon-carbon double bond. In other words, they're not as strong as a carbonyl. They're kind of what we call medium, medium strength. And generally, we're going to now categorize these if the absorption peak is close to a thousand we usually say the carbon of the carbon oxygen bond is is a methyl that's the methyl one so methyls are approximately 1000 i should have made this broader okay but so right about 1000 if you move up about 50 numbers to around 1050 so now i'm going to come down Pretend these are the same heights. We're going to go 1050, and I'm just moving it down for room. The carbon oxygen stretches at 1050, and these, again, are proximants, are the primary carbons. So primary carbons, like a primary alcohol, that CO stretch should be right around 1050. Um, we're going to switch colors again, and we're now going to go um, to about 1100. So 1100 should be exactly halfway between these two. So if you're approximately 1100 and you have a nice peak close to 1100, that's usually a secondary carbon oxygen stretch. And you're starting to see the, the picture here. Let's move over to 1150. So I'm going to now come down to the bottom again. And usually absorption around 1150, approximately, that's a tertiary carbon um, oxygen stretch, like for, tertiary, like for terbutyl alcohol. That usually has a stretch right around 1150 for that one. And lastly, I'm running out of colors here. If it's really close to 1200, that's usually the carbonyl carbon with a second CO stretch. Let me draw, so really close to 1200. We're gonna bring 1200 down. So imagine you're a carbonyl and you have another oxygen coming off. That single bond stretch usually comes in close to 1200. Now, remember the question we had earlier, how do we distinguish between ketones and esters? This is the way you distinguish. An ester will usually, actually I should say always, have two stretches in this region. One of them will be the carbonyl oxygen stretch. The other one can be any one of these four, depending if the carbon on this side is a methyl, primary, secondary, tertiary. Methyl, primary, secondary, tertiary. You can obtain two stretches in the carbon oxygen single bond zone. Typically, if you see two decent stretches in this region, you can bet your carbonyl was an ester. Um, now, what's also interesting, this stretch should also apply to the acid, and it usually does. But again, we usually can tell when we have an acid when we go back to the OH that's way over here. Okay, so again, the purpose of IR is clues to tell you what's not there, as important as what could be there. Uh, and it's not always 100% perfect, but there's a lot of clues. And we just lost camera. Oh, sorry, we lost, we didn't lose camera. We just lost the link to this TV. <laughs>
So the camera's still working. I'll keep talking. Keep it, it's still working there. Okay, so the last region is the aromatics. The strong aromatic absorptions always show up in between 900 and 600. Um, the aromatics tend to absorb as strongly as carbonyls, so they tend to be really long absorptions. If you think you have an aromatic compound and you don't, do not see any large absorption in this region, then you're wrong. It is not aromatic. Uh, now, some people like to talk about what they refer to as the four finger region, but it's not always visible on aromatic compounds. So I'm going to show you a simple aromatic called toluene to talk about these peaks differences. Okay, so I'm bringing in toluene right here between 2000 and 1700 are the four fingers. Now the only reason we can see these four fingers is, is because there's nothing else covering up like a carbonyl. Um, and so seeing the four fingers of an aromatic is not always a guarantee and they're incredibly small But an aromatic will always have large absorptions way down here You see how large these two absorptions if you do not have large absorptions in the aromatic region You do not have an aromatic it doesn't matter what you might see in here You must have the large absorptions to be an aromatic. Okay, so let's talk about those we have two chapters just on aromatics. Then we have aromatics showing up on all the rest of the chapters. They are, tend to be the favorite functional groups on ACS exams and all over the place. And so I want to talk about the most common aromatics that you will see. And that is the monosubstituted aromatics and the three disubstituted aromatics. If there's more than two substitutions on the benzene ring when you'll just see some strong absorptions here but it'll be hard to distinguish like the tri or tetra substituted benzene ring but the mono and the two di substitution ones we kind of can classify this way so the important ranges is, is 800 and 700 okay the monosubstituted benzene ring, the one where the benzene ring only has one thing attached to it. Okay, and I'm going to do these kind of in a tower so you can compare them. So we're going to do mono, then we're going to do, we'll do the ortho disubstituted, then we'll do the meta disubstituted, and then we'll do the para disubstituted. So this one's monosubstituted. These two are these three are the di substitution options, and you may have already learned this that ortho means they're next to each other on the benzene ring, and para means across from each other, and the meta is the in between position. Okay, when the absorptions being really strong, I'm not going to draw them that big because they'd all overlap. Um, but when you have a monosubstituted benzene ring you tend to have two fairly strong absorptions, one right below 700 and the other one just above 700. So let's draw the 700 lines all the way down for all of these. And we'll also draw the 800 line. Okay, so a monosubstituted absorption had two and if you recall on the, the one I showed you earlier, um, it was a mono substituted. I'm going to bring it back. And sorry, I'm going to tip it sideways. But you see two peaks. You see the 700 line. One was just below 700, the one was above 700. But it did not pass uh, the 800 line. So that's, that's a typical type of mono substitution. I need to warn you about the aromatic peaks. They don't always follow the general rules I'm about to give you, but they're usually do okay let's do ortho ortho substituted peaks tend to give you one nice absorption just above 700 um, that's very typical of an ortho benzene ring you get one usually about 1720 to 7 or 720 to 750 
uh, and that's typical of ortho. The meta almost looks nearly identical to the mono. In fact, normally when I tell students if you're looking at your IRs and you see these doubles, it could be meta, it could be mono. You're going to need another clue. Uh, there are other clues that may be given to you in the pro problem, such as the formula or an NMR spectroscopy. All right, so again, meta and mono, they look very similar, but they are different substitutions. The pair of substituted benzene rings are probably the easiest because, again, they're very unique in that they always have an absorption above 800, a really large absorption. And so if you're looking at your aromatic rings and you see an absorption above 800, you know it must be para. Uh, none of the others will have a, a really strong absorption above 800. Um, so those are the distinguishing uh, features of the aromatics. And again, let's review. What is the purpose of the infrared? The infrared is to give you clues what could be in your compound, but more importantly, what is not in your compound. So if there's no OH or NHs, those cannot be there. No triple bond, no carbonyls, no aromatic peaks. You can rule things out. And then hopefully you don't have to go and investigate the fingerprint region unless you're really deep, desperate. Okay, just to give you some examples. Um, I'm going to throw another one up here. Um, this one, they gave you the, the, the formula, but you see this is a para-substituted benzene ring. And if you look carefully, the huge absorption is above 800. Now, let's look at the other functional groups. So, because it's an NH2 at the 3300, so it's kind of hard to see the numbers. But we're going, so 30, this is 3,400. So between 32 and 34, we had these double peaks. These ones are spiky because this compound happens to be a crystalline solid. But we had nice hydrogen absorptions for the two uh, hydrogens on the, on the nitrogen. And as we mentioned earlier, that's typical of a primary mean. The carbon, so let's go down and look at the 3,000 line. 3,000 line basically split right between this side and that side. And so the absorptions, again, on the 2,900 side, that has to be sp3 absorptions. Absorptions above it, that's the sp2 hydrogens that are around the benzene ring that aren't shown here. Um, if you're looking for the four fingers, we only see one. Again, four fingers are not a guarantee. If we go here at 1600, and between 1600 and 1400, we're seeing two absorptions as for the double bonds that are inside the benzene ring. Um, the carbon nitrogen single bond stretch, you'll notice it's very similar, close to the carbon hydrogen ones. But again, the finger bent region, you don't look for unless you're desperate. But the aromatic is huge. That aromatic absorption 1800 at 800, that ha tells me it has to be um, para. Okay, so let me see if I can find one more spectrum. Let me go to where I bookmarked it. And um, just to give you some more clues. Okay, this is a problem that actually occurs in this semester when we get arrived at chapter 14. But some interesting things to look at. No H's, no NH's. Let's pretend you don't know the formula. There are four fingers here. There are hydrogens on this side and that side. And if you look carefully, hmm, it looks like both of these are below 800. It's really hard, but I don't see either the aromatics. So what does that mean this compound is? Well, it's either a meta or a mono substituted benzene ring. Um, from the nine carbons in the IHD, um, 
have to be an IHD, this, this one, uh, this to review it really fast. With nine carbons, you should have 20 hydrogens to be saturated. It's missing eight because there's only 12. So that means there's an IHD of four. IHD of four is mandatory for a benzene ring. So that means the other carbons are sp3. Whether it's an isopropyl or some methyls and ethyls, I'll have to look at the NMR, which we'll come back to later. But this is the NMR of said structure down here. Okay. So we're going to conclude infrared.